I am delighted to introduce our next speaker, John D. Liu. John started out as a journalist before deciding to become a filmmaker. When a film took him to the desertified Los Plateau, John recognized our potential to re-green our deserts and engage people in the process. John started the ecosystem restoration camps to bring folks together and make this happen all over the globe. And to showcase this drastic change that can happen, here is a short film by John D. Liu. We live on a magnificent planet that provides us with air, water, food, and energy, all that is needed for life to flourish. Yet vast areas of the planet's land surface have been deforested or degraded. Meanwhile, we struggle to reduce our impact on the climate, and many people are in desperate need of food, water, and decent productive livelihoods. The Global Partnership on Forest and Landscape Restoration has estimated there are more than 2 billion hectares worldwide where the potential for restoration is high. In 2011, the Bonn Challenge set a target of 150 million hectares of degraded and deforested lands to be restored by 2020. This is good news for communities and enterprises around the world that need the goods, services and other benefits that these restored hectares can provide. Sustainable land use and restoration of landscapes can provide nutrition, improve food security, stimulate local enterprise, reduce poverty, and increase flows of water so that sustainable agriculture becomes possible. And at the same time, it increases habitat for wildlife and reduces human impact on climate change. Landscape restoration and management offers an opportunity for economic growth for local communities and for the world and it can also continuously improve the land's ecological function. There are opportunities to turn degraded areas into healthy, fertile, working landscapes all over the world. Together, we can revitalize and transform the Earth's vast, degraded and deforested places to meet the needs of people and the natural world now and into the future. And with that, I will turn it over to John B. Liu. Hello, I'm John Liu. I'm here at the Moksha Hills, which was once known as the University of the Trees. It was the home of Christopher Hills and many very important cultural thinkers in the late 20th century came here People like Ken Kesey, uh, Alan Watts, Terence McKenna, and now I've been welcomed here to be a kind of uh, artist in residence while I'm isolating from the COVID virus and the pandemic that's going on around the world. I hope you and your family and all your loved ones and everyone on the earth is healthy at this time and that we can get back to normal soon. I'm very grateful to the organizers for inviting me and also grateful to the Common Land Foundation and the Mustard Seed Trust who make it possible for me to continue to do this work. In my late 20s, I had the opportunity to go to China, and I helped to open the CBS News Bureau at the time of normalization of relations between China and the United States, and observe as China transitioned from a sort of sleepy, radical, chic, communist backwater to a superpower and the manufacturing center for the whole world. And I covered lots of really quite interesting stories which kept me moving for quite a long time and I was kind of exhausted from all this activity 
Then the World Bank asked me to film a baseline study of the Lus Plateau Watershed Rehabilitation Project in the upper and middle reaches of the Yellow River. And I began to travel and to observe and document the Yellow River that was once known as the Mother River and comes out of the Tibetan highlands and then flows south of the magnificent Mongolian steppe. This was an interesting part of the world because this was the cradle of Chinese civilization and the birthplace of the Han race. Actually, all the different tribes were vying around this area. There were Kazakhs and Uyghurs and Mongols and so on. But the Han emerged as the dominant culture. And the Lus Plateau is an area of 640,000 square kilometers, approximately the size of France. And it's named for the geomorphology of the subsoil, which is Lus. And Lus is made from the movements of glaciers high in the Himalayas, crushing the granite rocks, and then the dust is blown over millions and millions of years, and it's settled on the, the plateau below. And these are the largest Lus deposits in the world, and they're very minerally rich, but they require organic material to be fertile. And because of where they are, if you dig around in there, you might find some very interesting things. So it was here in the Lus Plateau where the early dynasties, the, the Han, the Qin, the Tang, were located. The Lus Plateau must have been a really wonderful place to give birth to the largest ethnic group on the planet. This is to the southwest of the Lus Plateau, and it's a beautiful, completely functional forested system. And this is to the northeast in Mongolia. It's a fully functional grassland ecosystem. These systems were contiguous, and so it was in this type of a an area that the Chinese race emerged. There's evidence of humans and their ancestors for a million and a half years in this region, according to Chinese uh, scientists. And this is the second place on Earth where settled agriculture began almost simultaneously with the Middle East. When I got there to document the Lus Plateau watershed rehabilitation, the place was fundamentally ecologically destroyed. It was pretty stunning to see this level of degradation. And I realized that covering politics and economics had not really prepared me for this and that I was going to have to do quite a bit of study to fully understand it. But I, I could see immediately that I was seeing a cycle of poverty and ecological destruction where each generation's behaviors were causing this massive change in the landscape. And at this point, it had reached a collapse system. And so the people who lived there were pretty much in desperate poverty and had very few opportunities to escape from this. Actually, their behaviors, which were ecologically destructive, just prolonged this, this degradation. They were living in caves, in many cases, in this area, and they were participating in a cycle of poverty and ecological destruction that was passed from generation to generation. They were removing the biodiversity, the biomass, and they had lost virtually all of the accumulated organic matter. And it was 
a really fascinating thing to see, but it was also a little bit heartbreaking to realize how fundamentally degraded the lands were. Exactly what causes a place that was once bountiful to become so degraded? What has happened here is that originally you had a complete vegetation cover with a fully intact hydrocycle. All the rainfall that fell down stayed where it was initially. It slowly infiltrated into the ground, was absorbed by the root system, went into the groundwater and eventually drained into the Yellow River over a long period of time, hundreds of days between a rainfall event and by the time the water ended up in the Yellow River. As the vegetation cover was removed gradually, the runoff increased dramatically every century, every decade, to the point where now when it rains, 95% of the water immediately is lost to the, to the environment where it's, where it's coming down. Immediately it runs off in a gully, takes a lot of the topsoil with it and ends up in the Yellow River. So you have a situation where literally 95% of the water is gone. And this is the reason why this area is so dry, why the rainfall has been decreased, why the vegetation cover can hardly be sustained right now because everything is so dried up. Now, when we came to this place in the Lois Plateau the first time, we were all really shocked. You know, we thought, oh my God, you know, well, how can, how can ever anybody try to rehabilitate an area that is so huge and so fundamentally destroyed ecologically? And the truth is we spent two years working with the local people, with the farmers, with the local officials, with the, with the experts in the various fields of hydrology, soil and water conservation, forestry, agriculture, environment, try to understand what it would take to do something like this. And after two years, we still didn't have many answers. The World Bank didn't have the answer and the local people didn't have the answer. And we spent another year and a half talking to the farmers in the villages, trying to understand what they had done in the past 20 or 30 years that was successful. And it was really interesting, not much was there to show because the current practices at that time were just not sustainable at all. The behaviors had to stop. So they essentially made a decision to ban all of the negative behaviors and to subsidize the people there to learn new skills and to restore the landscape. So they prepared about $500 million over 10 years. And the pilot area was 35,000 square kilometers, approximately the size of Belgium. And it was a, a massive holistic undertaking you're seeing them terracing here, but it wasn't a terracing program. It was a holistic program that worked to create water retention landscapes and to rebuild the soils and to restore vegetative cover everywhere. And interestingly, they re reduced the area in cultivation and released vast areas of the land for natural regeneration. And they then increased the soil fertility in lesser areas, smaller areas, while re releasing quite a lot of the land for natural systems. So there was ecological land. And I sort of noticed when I was working in Africa and other parts of the world that in many areas, the farmers believe you have to increase the area for crops. And this is 
really devastating. And what the Chinese did was they reduced the area where crops were grown and massively increased the natural ecological areas. This is Tafu Yuan from the Ministry of Water Resources, and he's saying that they're going to restore the forests on the hilltops, and they're going to restore the, the um, terraces to infiltrate the water. And at the bottom, they're going to put in sediment traps and d small dams to accumulate the water. And they did this, and over, over time, you can see what the result is. So this was in 1994 when we first went out there in September. And the next shot is in 2009. So 15 years later, they were able to achieve this type of restoration. And I think in the next transition, this is again, this is a, an area I went back to many times, Hojago in Shanxi province. And this again, September uh, 94 to September 2009. And what we saw was that the natural regeneration of, of the ecological lands actually were the basis of the support for the agricultural lands. So it was possible for them to increase productivity by reducing the area in cultivation. And they were recognizing the natural ecological function has a value. And the value of that is higher than the value of the production. So this was quite a huge difference. I began to question many of the things that I had been taught in school and the socialization that I was getting. And I realized that what I was seeing was it's possible to rehabilitate large-scale degraded landscapes, including areas that had been destroyed over long historic time and over vast areas. And this is really important because this is exactly what we need to do over vast areas throughout the world. And I also realized that there were huge scientific implications to this, which challenge many of the things that have been um, norms. For instance, it's possible to rehydrate dehydrated biomes. So we need to really consider how, how that takes place. What are the processes that cause this? And I started to see that there were certain um, principles. For instance, I noticed that in degraded lands, the temperatures were vastly different than below a canopy. And this is a, a, a serious clue to the global warming and climate Im implications. And I also saw that understanding, human understanding, was in a way the determining factor for whether ecological systems were functional or dysfunctional. So I think this is of critical importance for us to consider. How can we use that information? As I was doing this, I was beginning to realize, well, this is not a typical assignment. This is something that I'm called, I was called to, to follow for now decades. And I became very philosophical and I began to see that I was, it was able, I was able to look through time. And I started to think about how the earth formed as a molten rock surrounded by gases we can't breathe. And then microbial um, development 
transformed the, the Earth's surface and the massive biodiversity that, that emerged from this and that a biochemical photoreactive process released and created and constantly filtered and continuously renewed an oxygenated atmosphere. And that as each generation of life died and gave up its body, it created the pedosphere on top of the lithosphere that also processed the hydrological cycle. And so all of these processes are related and symbiotic. They don't exist in isolation. You can't consider them individually because they're, they're inherently connected to all the other systems. And I realized that into this system, human beings emerge very late in, in the evolution. And at that time, we, we were under the canopy and we were benefiting from all of the ecological function. And this is very close to the Judeo-Christian Islamic cosmology. And I realized that we became very good hunters at one point. I think we studied social hunters like lions or hyenas or coyotes or these sorts of animals which are social hunters. And we became very good at that. But I think we were prey before we were predators. And when we became very good predators, we actually drove many megafauna to extinction. This is just a cat video to make you like me. When we got to a certain point in our development, we didn't want to just hunt things. This is what it looks like when you take the door off of a helicopter and fly over the uh, beautiful w wild areas of Mexico. And I put this in so that you can see the power of natural systems. And we've been disrupting these extremely powerful systems for a few thousand years now. If you, if you consider that evolution began 3.8 billion years ago, in just 10 or 12,000 years of agriculture, we've had an incredible impact. And we really need to, to understand this. So all over the world, we've reduced biodiversity, reduced biomass, and reduced the accumulation of organic material. And in doing this, we have reversed the evolutionary successional outcomes. And when you do that, you start to lose the functionality. And ultimately, if you continue this without ever understanding this, you collapse the ecosystems. And I believe this is what has happened over very large areas. But what's interesting is that we have seen that in every, every place where this is the case, it's had the same outcome. So in many places around the world, civilizations have failed because they destroyed their hydrology, their soil fertility, and their biodiversity, and then their civilizations collapsed. So what I noticed was that I'm only, I was only seeing two states, functional 
are dysfunctional and that the functional systems are accumulative. They have natural regulation. They're robust and resilient and renewable. But the dysfunctional ones are not. And I realized in, in China at the time of agriculture, they had a nearly pristine system and they were headed toward ecological collapse. But when they analyzed and changed the direction and made an intervention, they got a different outcome. That seems to be the paradigm shift that determines whether humanity continues to collapse the systems or understands and returns to alignment with that. And I think that this is the great work of our time. This is what we're called to understand and called to do now. If we're unable to do this, then we're going to have quite serious implications. We're already experiencing that. And I started to see that actually some of the things that we need to do are not that difficult. This is dune stabilization. So dune stabilization is very simple in this way. You're just putting in straw in, in grids and whatever moisture there is will follow that straw down into the ground and then bacteria will begin to break it down and any moisture that goes in there and then birds will lay, will, will put their droppings on there, bringing seeds. And without even planting, you can actually stimulate the restoration of these areas. This is uh, composting. This is uh, Thomas Luthi from the Demeter. And they're making some of the best compost I've ever seen very, very rapidly. And they, they, they can teach this. So we, if we learn how to do this and restore our soils, then we can have the basis to continue to, to, to have a holistic restoration of all the systems. So it's apropos to the soil region summit to understand how to do this. But we can also revegetate at scale. The Chinese, when I showed the, Chi the Africans, when I showed the Africans what the Chinese are doing with tree nurseries, they said, well, that's a forest. And I said, no, no, that's the nursery. But this allows you to reforest. And when you plant larger trees, then you're going to get an especially good result because they're less likely <clears throat> to, to die. And what I began to realize was that everyone has a role to play in this, that if we can shift human intention away from production and consumption to restoration, then we will get a completely different result. <clears throat> These nurseries are in South Africa. And um, I believe the next ones, these are in Mexico, I believe. This is in Ethiopia. Ethiopia has done a, a great deal of work. They're having some political difficulties now, but their land, sustainable land management program was very, very successful in shifting people toward regeneration. And the level of ability of these people in many parts of the world is very high. But we've tried to force them into mercantilism. This is in Mexico. And these are very, very well-developed nurseries. This is showing the parts of the world which are massively degraded. And the fact that if we were to use the techniques that were used on the Lus Plateau, we could have a very, very large impact. The satellite images from 
China is astonishing in, in, in its scale. And we have just begun to understand what this means, that th this is functionality. This is it in, in, a, in a beautiful community in Portugal called Tamara. And it's, it's a place where they're doing water retention landscapes using the Sepholzer methods. Sepholzer came and helped them to do that. But they're also trans, they're, the whole community is, is focused on restoring natural systems. And they're very successful with this. And I, I started to think about how could we do this? Could we, could this be something that is done collectively? So instead of everyone trying, there's Sepp Holzer, <laughs> but in, if everybody is working together rather than striving just for self, self-interest, that we can get another result. And I started to talk about this and gradually we began to consider creating ecosystem restoration camps. And if you know anything about this movement, approximately four years ago, we started to, to discuss it. And then the first year there was a camp in Spain, the second year uh, a new camp in Mexico, and then the third year there were 21 camps, and the fourth year 37 camps. So this, this type of growth rate suggests um, exponential growth. So if we can continue to do this and, and create uh, vast numbers of people who are working for the restoration of the earth, it's going to be stronger than if we have everybody running around trying to, to just gather material possessions to themselves. And I think there's quite a lot of potential for innovation. We've been talking with the Buckminster Fuller Foundation and with the Burning Man uh, festivals. And so there's increasingly collectivized actions that we can take. And I think we have to, to transition the central intention of human civilization. And we have to do this effectively. And I realized that as I was studying, I was seeing in journalism who, what, when, and where. And I pretty much got all that. And then I started to consider why. Why are we seeing these kinds of of this kind of degradation? How is it, you know, what is the, the factor for this? What is causing it? And I realized that the systems that exist in nature have been essentially said to be zero, to be free, free goods for human beings to exploit regardless of what are the consequences and that this is fundamentally false. There's, there, this is, creates a structural problem in our economic systems because we can see that it's impossible to infinitely grow an economy based on finite resources. So by doing this, we're actually creating a perverse incentive to degrade the natural ecosystems. And this cannot work. It's an impossibility. The other thing that I noticed was that the ecological function, the oxygenated atmosphere, the freshwater system, the, the soil fertility, the biodiversity, were essentially zero in the GDP economy. This cannot be true. This is fundamentally false. So we have these 
illogical ideas at the basis of human security now. And until we address this, we can't solve these problems. We need to look at natural systems and understand that they are valuable and that they're more valuable than anything that human beings have ever made and everything that human beings will ever make. And then from that perspective, we're forced to protect them. We can eliminate the perverse incentive that says the things we make are more valuable than nature. The world is facing multiple problems. We have biodiversity loss, climate change, desertification, food insecurity, poverty, disparity, and now the threat of financial collapse. It seems like there are two conversations going on, one in the developed world, which is talking about economics and technical solutions, and another one in the developing world, which is talking about survival and sustainability. I've begun to see this differently. When it comes to survival and sustainability, there's only one story for the human species, and we're all in this together. All our problems are interrelated. Far from being mysterious, they're actually the logical outcomes of the type of economic system that we've created. And this also seems to point toward the solution. We know when we see a forest, a lake, the ocean, a natural river system, the atmosphere, that it's more valuable than computers, cars, or airplanes, which are valuable for a short time, but then become trash and pollution. Natural systems are renewable. They've evolved over billions of years, and they are infinitely valuable. Now, the global economy values production and consumption. And although few understand it, speculation. This has suggested the finite derivatives shaped from the Earth's natural systems are somehow more valuable than the infinitely renewable systems themselves. This is simply wrong. We need to admit that we made this mistake. If we were to truly value natural systems, the nature would become the basis of our money and our economy. To protect nature, then, would not be a luxury, but a necessity. This brings us much closer to the truth, because we must have water, air, and fertile soils. But we just want computers, cars, and airplanes. We can change. It will not be easy, but we can and we must do it. I think there are two possibilities. If we are thoughtful and do the right thing, then we can consciously transition to a new paradigm in which human actions and the natural environment are in harmony. The other possibility is that the current system implodes from its own corruption and mistakes and we are forced to try to salvage whatever we can of human civilization. For the sake of the children and future generations of life, we need to consciously decide to do the right thing. When we do that, we'll understand that wealth is coming from natural ecosystem function. And this will be the basis of our money and all human actions will go to conserving and protecting and restoring ecological function on Earth. We need to shift societal intent away from the production and consumption and waste of, of the economic system as we see it now and realize that wealth is coming from natural ecosystem function. If we run out of water, if we run out of fertile soils, if we run out of air, if we alter the climate, our money is worthless. We have to understand that the true wealth on the earth is coming from natural ecological function. And if we do this, if we choose this, then our money and our economy will reflect that. And all human activity will go toward conservation and wherever the land is degraded, restoration. Because that's the way to protect wealth 
and that's the way to increase wealth. The movement that we're building here together is about bringing back hope. It's about bringing back a purpose in life. The biggest problem that exists on our planet Earth now is climate change. So as a result, we're facing so many problems, but the solution to them is the same. We start restoring the ecology, the ecosystems. If we apply regenerative techniques to bring it back to life, this is enough to reverse climate change. The purpose of ecosystem restoration camps is to restore land that has been degraded by humans. What we need to do is go to the historically degraded landscapes, which were once the Garden of Eden. Volunteers can come from around the world or they can be local community members volunteering five hours a day helping to restore the planet. We are ecosystem restoration camps. You're not waiting for somebody else to do the work. To join a group that is actually restoring this planet. I quit my studies to come here to do a little bit of service, to give myself to the planet. This is the thing that I wanted to do. This is the tribe that I want to join. Can be a solution bigger than the things that I can do alone. This, this is where I want to be. This is what I want to be doing. We need to stand up together. We're, we're a new international of green-minded people. It's, it's a viral concept, that's why it's so strong. It starts with one camp, a lot of people going through that camp, they bring the idea home, they may start new camps. Go from a very degraded ecosystem back to a fully functional ecosystem, everybody open their eyes and they're like, oh, it's that simple. Desert used to be productive lands and could be made productive again. It is possible to change a landscape from a desert and to completely regreen it so that there's food, water, and, and wildlife in abundance. I think the camp also can teach us that we can live with very simple, eat the food we grow, um, sleep under the stars, and still have our comfort. Camps is, is a simple way. People get closer to the, to the earth and to the ecosystems themselves, and it's, uh, it's easy to implement and it doesn't leave traces. A great place to experiment for scientists, a great place to learn, uh, how to grow food, how to become more self-sufficient. Soil is the basis of life. If you have a, a soil that has no life, nothing good can grow from there. Well, by restoring the ecosystem, which involves restoring the soil, adding more organic matter to the soil and more life, uh, that soil will hold the water much longer, will hold much more nutrients, and that way bring back fertility. As we start planting trees, we start taking carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, we, we start that process of reversing climate change. This area in Spain, for example, is, a, is one of, of the most abandoned areas in Spain. Degradation of the, of the ecosystem mirrors in the degradation of society. It's not just about restoring the land, it's also about restoring, restoring the societies, restoring people. With new people coming in and new knowledge coming in, connecting with local so the, the bakery at the local village has a better business too. Farmers will have be an example of how to do things that they can copy on their land. Be um, an inspiration uh, for the region, for other farmers who are here struggling, but also for young people maybe to come back to the land and like see that farming is actually can be cool. Let's let's kind of bring back the spirit of, of childhood of game but of projects of doing things together uh, i think that the, the camp will bring back that possibility of playing like a kid but with a purpose so the more that ordinary people like you and me are able to stand up and and support it the more momentum that it's going to get many initiatives all around the world are popping up everybody wants to make a camp now that's fantastic and that's what we wanted uh, we wanted to inspire the people to take initiative you can come to camp. I think that would be a really great option for someone who is available and wants to do something meaningful. They're going to be offering permaculture design courses here. Um, but if you can't come, you can become a member of Ecosystem Restoration Camps by donating 10 euro per month. That's just a really simple way to basically make these camps a reality. We want to restore the earth. We want to live in the beautiful paradise that the earth is. Come to Ecosystem Restoration Camps and make part of the solution join other like-minded people who say, yeah, we can do it. We can reverse this biggest problem ever existed.
going back to the ground, uh, getting dirty, getting back to the soul. We love with joy, with compañerismo and camaraderia uh, is definitely going to make this happen. One of the things that I've been most interested in understanding is what is possible? What exactly can we do with ecological restoration? In China, I found an extraordinary example. This is the Taklamakan Desert. It means you go in, but you don't come out. And even here, the Chinese were able to put in a shelter belt throughout the entire desert for 426 kilometers through the middle of this amazing desert. And I found that the temperatures differ from below the canopy, this vegetative canopy, to the open sands by 45 degrees centigrade. Now, when you understand that that causes wind speed, wind direction, and vortex activity, then you recognize that actually these physical disruptions on Earth systems can have enormous consequences. This is a satellite image with three hurricanes in one satellite photo. Now, until a couple of years ago, this was impossible to see. But now, with the, the changes, it's possible. And we've been working on a restoration project design for the Sinai Peninsula, which is about to happen. It's uh, right now in final negotiations to begin the aquatic parts, and then we will move into the terrestrial parts uh, immediately following that using John Todd's um, eco-machines to start generating fresh water and to start restoring the, uh, the soils and the vegetation. On the, and when we do that, we can lower the temperatures. And we've seen the possibility that when we lower the temperatures, we can bring back moisture. And, of course, really what we're doing is we're creating habitat for the basic building blocks of ecology for the microbial and fungal communities to rebuild organic soils. So the blending of geologic soils together with organic material and organic soils are the basis of, of creating beautiful, biodiverse, ecological systems. And we can see that it's possible to make this happen. Areas that were once degraded are now being restored. And so we can do this at scale. I think the best phrase to describe the complexity in ecological systems is multidimensional symbiotic systems. And these systems create, constantly filter, and continuously renew the life support systems on the earth, they're the basis of the oxygenated atmosphere, the freshwater system, the soil fertility, and the massive biodiversity on earth. And they regulate all of the systems, the weather, the climate, the temperature. As I was working on this, we it has led to different types of interventions. First in China, I've studied the restoration of China's Lus Plateau, which is the cradle of civilization for the Han race and, and Chinese civilization. And I also 
was asked by the World Bank, the British government, and the Global Environment Facility to share what I was learning in Africa in the early part of the 21st century. And this led to interesting dramatic results where Rwanda and Ethiopia began very large systematic programs for land restoration. So there's quite a bit of data coming from those projects as well. And I've been involved in other types of large restoration projects. Human impact on all the various systems is clear. We can see that the organic layer, respiration, the height of the canopy, the total amounts and the percentages of biomass and respiration around the world are what's regulating the hydrology, the weather, and the climate. And that's creating the soil fertility, the habitat for microbial and fungal communities, which are releasing geologic materials for availability to biological life. This is the synthesis of what our science is telling us. And it's not so complex that we all can't understand it. And we all have a role to play in making sure that we come back to a type of dynamic equilibrium at a higher state. So we have forced the, the ec ecology, the earth systems, to seek equilibrium at a degraded state. That's very dangerous for us.